Thank you very much to Paul Farley. People who know me will know that I get really viscerally and kind of ridiculously excited by new books. When they arrive, I just rip open the jiffy bag and I want to read them. And this is a true story. When I got older, Sharon Olds of Stag's Leave, I got so excited, I forgot to take my thumb out the door and I shut the door on my thumb and it really hurt. And, <laughs> and so this book has always been associated for me with pain and with the kind of... Um, <laughs> with recovery from pain, which is in the end what this book is about. So as I read the book, it kind of healed my thumb and it also, what it is about, it's about pain and recovery and finally redemption. It's about the loss of love. But what I think makes it so wonderful is that Sharon Olds, whose work I've been reading for so many years, her first book published by Slow Dancer Press in the UK in 1987, a long, long time ago. It seems that what she does is she'll take a kind of familiar territory of the heart but she walks on it as though she's walking on a field of snow for the first time and it's as though you know this field and it's got snow on it but somehow Sharon Old's footsteps are the first ones that you're ever going to see on it. She's a really really remarkable writer. It's great to welcome Sharon Old. Thank you so much. It's such a joy to be here. Thank you for having me and to be hearing and to be in the company of these amazing poets. Yes, this uh, Stag's Leap is a, is a, I think of it as an end of long marriage book. And as you said, a book of um, hmm, shock, loss, uh, mourning, and healing. I'll read two poems, one from near the beginning and one from near the end. Poem for the Breasts. Like other identical twins, they can be better told apart in adulthood. One is fast to wrinkle her brow, her brain, her quick intelligence. The other dreams inside a constellation, freckles of Orion. They were born when I was 13. They rose up half out of my chest. Now they're 40, wise, generous. I am inside them, in a way under them, or I carry them. I'd been alive so many years without them. I can't say I am them, though their feelings are almost my feelings, as with someone one loves. They seem to me like a gift that I have to give. That boys were said to worship their category of being, almost starved for it, did not escape me. And some young men loved them the way one would want oneself to be loved. All year they have been calling to my departed husband, singing to him like a pair of soaking sirens on a scaled rock. They can't believe he's left them. It's not in their vocabulary, they being made of promise. They're like literally kept vows. Sometimes now, I hold them a moment, one in each hand, twin widows, heavy with grief. They were a gift to me, and then they were ours, like thirsty nurslings of excitement and plenty. And now it's the same season again, the very week he moved out. Didn't he whisper to them, wait here for me one year? No. He said, God be with you, God by with you, God by, for the rest of this life and for the long nothing. And they do not know language. They are waiting for him. My Christ, they are dumb. They do not even know they are mortal, sweet, I guess, refreshing to live with, beings without the knowledge of death, creatures of ignorant suffering. Years later, at first glance, 
there on the bench where he'd agreed to meet. It didn't seem to be him, but then the face of grim friendliness was my former husband's, like the face of a creature looking out from inside its knocks. No fault, no knock. Clever nut of the hearing aid, hidden in the ear, I do not feel I love anymore. Patch of bandage on the cheek, peopled with tiny lichen from a land I don't know. We walk. I had not remembered how deep he held himself inside himself, my fun for 32 years to lure him out. I still kind of want to, as if I see him as a being with a baby paw caught. His voice is the same, low, still pushed around the level bubble in his throat. We talk of the kids, and it's as if that will never be taken from us. But it feels as if he's not here. Though he's here, it feels as if, for me, there's no one there. As when he was with me, it seemed there was no one there for any other woman for the first 30 years. Now I see I've been hoping each time we meet that he would praise me for how well I took it, but it's not to be. Are you happy as you thought you'd be? I ask. Yes. And his smile is touchingly pleased. I thought you'd look happier, I say. But after all, when I am looking at you, you're with me. <laughs> we smile, his eyes warm a moment with the accustomed shift, as if he's turning into the species he was for those 30 years and turning back. I glance toward his torso once, his legs. He's like a stick figure now, the way when I was with him, other men seemed like Ken dolls, all clothes. Even the gold of his fresh wedding ring is no blade to my rib. This is married Ken. As I walk him toward his street, I joke, and for an instant, He's alive toward me, a gem of sea of pond in his eye. Then that retreat into himself, which always moved me, as if there were a sideways gravity in him toward some vanishing point. And no, he does not want to meet again in a year. When we part, it is with a dry bow and goodbye. And then there is the spring park, damp as if freshly peeled, sweet greenhouse, green cemetery with no dead in it, except in some shaded woods under some years of leaves and rotted cones, the body of a warbler like a whole note fallen from the sky, my old love for him like a songbird's ribcage Thank you.